Robert Davis, Stokely Carmichael, Huey P. Newton, they were our heroes. But you see the situation for black people here being the same as the situation for blacks in America? Yes, because they're, they're both being oppressed by, by a fascist system, uh, of which uh, we believe that America is, is the centre. This is how it is. This is what's happening to you as a black person in this country, you know, opening our eyes to the politics, breaking it all down. My bad party calls for freedom. reach out to uh, an international understanding of what black is. Black Panther Party calls for an educational system that will tell us the true facts about this decadent society. Black power was like being proud of your black self, as in the color of your skin, as in your race. First time, blacks were in their face. I didn't know how to hand. We re really did live under a police site in, in Queensland, right through the 50s and 60s and 70s. Those cops were, uh, they were just psychopathic. They, they would have gladly have killed and if they would have killed, nothing, nothing would have happened. I think they probably would have got a promotion. We were there on what they used to call the peak patrol. That was a terminology. We, we, we used some terminology that the bandits used to. The peak patrol, you go out and watch them, what they do, and you show them that you're watching them, and you're going to do something about it. And we just kind of accepted any of them. And we would record um, the identity of the cops, the registration numbers of the vehicles, the numbers of arrests, the charges, the way in which the cops treat our people, etc. And then we'd go to court the next morning and we'd talk to our mobs, see if they were okay, see how they're treated, and see if they wanted us to stand with them when they appeared before the, uh, before the magistrate. We always had uh, cops and ASIO and just parked down the road outside. We always had them hanging, you know, parked watching us. I can remember the police being outside. They just sit daily, just, just kept watching the house. I remember one morning waking up, they were, we were all asleep upstairs, and there must have been about five or six I don't, don't know how they came in, but they were get, telling us to get up and, um, you know, get dressed and... The most graphic thing about Dennis was uh, he was always uh, talking of the violence. Black Panther Party, say, Australia. Party says that um, everyone has a right to defend themselves against an aggressive enemy. And is them. It is inhuman. It's denying a person's human rights if you give a gun to one man and don't give it to another one. Uh, if, if one person in this community is going to have a gun, and the police have guns, and the army has guns, and I believe everyone should be uh, uh, allowed to have guns. I, I was always surrounded by my family and other elders who were always looking for the middle road, trying to negotiate. But Dennis, Dennis was always standing up and then talking up. Being a young bloke, you know, full of piss and bad manners, etc. So I thought that uh, he was feeling interesting and uh, I should listen more to him. So, yeah. What are we standing around here? Oh, good, oh, good. You black guy don't like? Which is something blacks have got to face up to sooner or later. Dennis's words were a threat to, well, 
don't know, government or I don't know. Land rights isn't a word, it's a living. It's people. To black people, it's a living. To white people, it's money. And they're gonna kill black people one way or another to get that money. Black power was a long way from out back 1950s Queensland, where I grew up. I was born in Cunnamulla, French camp there. We just lived out in isolation, you know, like in a tent out in the bush, uh, away from everybody, you know. To be somebody. I've always wanted to get a good education, be somebody. And I wanted to go to high school and I asked my father, give me money for books. He really was just like, uh, we were just poor all the time, you know. The, the gambling was just affecting everything. So I wrote to my uncle Georgie on Palm Island and sent me fifteen dollars to buy a uniform, which is quite a bit of money then. And he did. He sent me fifteen dollars. My father saw that I got this letter with the notes in it. I really, really wanted to go to high school. I really, really wanted to get an education. And he took it away from me. So I pissed off from home. And that's when my journey with the Panthers began. My attraction in the Panthers was how I could contribute was through the arts. I loved playing the part of this superhero, Aboriginal woman who used to come to the rescue of um, um, women getting beat, beaten up, I'd just come in, I knew Kung Fu and everything, and I'd chop them with them and take their wallet off them and give it to them. <laughs> and it, yeah, this is a kind of black theatre that we acted out that, that attracted me. We used to perform for students and the Aboriginal community. I was in my prime, I was in love, and the Panthers, well, we became like family. She was like the one. 